guys so much for being here tonight and thank you for having me. Um, I think this is an extremely important topic for New York City parents, so I'm so happy to be here uh, to bring the knowledge to the parents. So, of course, whatever you learn here tonight, I always ask that you share it with any parents, principals, guidance counselors, community leaders that you know, because we need everyone in New York City to have access to this information, okay? All right, so let's start off by going through the presentation. All right, so tonight we're talking about how do we get your child into a top high school, okay? So we have um, our table of contents here, and I'm just going to go right through it. So feel free to take notes throughout the entire presentation. I'm going to be talking about a lot of valuable information, so have your notebook and pens ready, okay? If you have any additional questions, you can email info at admissionsquad.org, and we'd be happy to provide you guys with anything that you need. And then finally, we're on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram at Admission Squad, okay? Perfect. So first, I wanted to talk a little bit about myself. You guys heard a bit about, about my background. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Admission Squad, and we aim to get talented middle schoolers into top high schools. I also just worked on my first book called Who Am I? An A to Z Career Guide for Teens because I noticed a lot of folks going into top colleges and top high schools, but really struggling with navigating into top level career paths. And so this book has aggregated a lot of the career paths that I feel are not being funneled into certain communities so that we can have a fair shot at gaining access to some of those fields, okay? Now, I also have an advanced readers diploma from Bronx Science, a BA in mathematics from Duke, and you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at I am Ty Abrams, and then on Twitter at Ty Abrams, and I have my website. Now, Admission Squad was founded by Specialized High School alumni because me and my business partner, we both had an opportunity to go into, uh, to matriculate into specialized high schools, but we noticed that, uh, you know, we noticed that a lot of folks were not providing that information for us. So we ended up having just like one or two people, you know, really intervene on our behalf to make sure that we had that opportunity, but we figured, why should our futures be left up to chance? There needed to be a program in place that had structure that would have some level of success rate so that we could matriculate larger numbers of students who look like us into these schools, okay? So that was the premise around it, and we have three primary missions. The first is we help sixth and seventh graders perform exceptionally on state exams because we all know that in order to get into top high schools, you need to have exceptional grades on your state exams. We also prepare rising eighth graders for all of the high school entrance exams, and that's not just the SHSAT. You have schools like Bard, Nest Plus M, and Brooklyn College, Brooklyn College Academy that require entrance exams, okay? And one of our biggest missions is to guide parents through the high school application process. We take this information gap seriously because we recognize that a lot of parents and students lack the information necessary to be able to navigate the high school admissions process. So we even start with parents in elementary school and we help them to get the information that they need so that they are setting their children up on the pipeline for success, okay? All right, so I wanted to just check in with the audience. Who am I talking to? Do we have um, parents with children in fifth grade? Raise your hand. Sixth grade? No, no, seventh grade? Okay, in eighth grade? Excellent, so I just wanted to know who I'm talking to so I can know how to center my conversation, okay? All right, so you can guys can follow along in your packets that I handed out for you guys, all right? I start off this presentation working backwards. The goal in general is always to get into a top college, right? So a lot of times, you know, if I ask a parent, you know, what school do you want your child to go to for college? What would you say? Yale. Yale, okay. <laughs> do you, where, where did you want to go to school for college? Um, actually, I'm an HBCU alum, so I would say the HBCU Howard or Xavier. Okay. Alma mater. Excellent. Yeah. What was your biggest aspiration for college? Um, to do good, I can get a good job. Huh? Yeah. No, like which college oh. did you want to go to? Oh, I went to NYIT. I NYIT. And if you had children, what would what would be your biggest goal for them? Uh, to go to the best school possible. Do you have anyone in mind that you were thinking of? No? Okay. Uh, I don't <laughs> so, have any kids or anything. Okay, okay. Well, most parents, they all automatically say Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Dartmouth. I went to do like schools like that, right? And so the whole point is we want that to be a reality for our children, but we need to work backwards to figure out what schools are they scouting students from. Okay, so we start off by figuring out what is most important for admissions officers at top colleges, okay? And that is a strong curriculum, a strong transcript, and strong test scores. 
And so to position your child to have access to those three things, you want to make sure that you get them into a top high school. Okay? Now, what is a top high school? Our definition of a top high school is one that prioritizes rigor and college readiness. Okay? It should have above average region scores, above average SAT and ACT scores. It should have excellent graduation rates and college enrollment rates. It should also have a above average A, B, and I, B course offerings, and of course, College Now course offerings. Okay? So keep those in mind. Now, why should you attend a rigorous high school? <clears throat> excellent question. I always talk about, you know, we talk about peer pressure, and peer pressure can be a negative thing, but there is something called positive peer pressure. And when your child is placed into these environments, naturally, there are certain things that tend to happen. They're more likely to go to graduate from high school. They're more likely to go to one of the top colleges. They're more likely to be accepted, right, into some sort of a university that's going to position them for long-term career success. They're also likely to develop good study habits, time management, and stress habits. And finally, they're better equipped for the college workload. Now, I talk about it all the time. I got into Bronx Science because I had an amazing mentor in middle school, and I did a great job, but the reason why I ended up going to Duke was because of the positive peer pressure. Everyone that I went to school with was aspiring to the Harvards, the Princetons, the Yales, right? So when it came time, as much as I had like the 95 average, when I was being asked, well, what college do you want to go to? A lot of my peers were only aiming for the best. So I just said, oh, well, I guess I'm supposed to aim for the best, right? But you have a lot of high schools in New York City where the guidance counselors and a lot of the people who the children are going to school with, they won't prioritize these colleges. In fact, they will minimize what they think that child can achieve. Okay, so you want your child to be in an environment where, especially for the parents who are busy at work and they can't be as hands on, you want an environment that's going to send them into the right environments for college, okay, and career and beyond. So that's the, the major benefit for attending a rigorous high school. Okay? All right, so who are the specialized high schools? That's what I'm going to talk about next. Um, we're going to get into the special, the top high schools in general, but I'm going to start off by talking about the specialized high schools. If you turn to the next page in your packet, I've you know, our company, we've collected the top high schools. We'll be updating this list, so stay tuned for that. But you can see a full list of the top high schools in New York City. So looking at the specialized high schools, there are nine total, okay? And eight of them happen to be testing schools. All right, so we're looking at schools like Stuyvesant, Queen Science at York College, the High School of Math, Science, and Engineering at City College. You have Brooklyn Latin, you have Brooklyn Tech, you have the Bronx High School of Science, my alma mater. You have Staten Island Tech, and you have the High School of American Studies at Lehman. We won't be talking as much about LaGuardia High School because that's actually a performing arts school. That, those types of schools, you need some sort of a portfolio, you have to audition, you have to bring your talents to the, to the table. So if you know you have a child that's of that nature and they're extremely talented, you want to look into LaGuardia and some of those other schools. And we do have a list of all of the best performing arts schools available to your child in New York City. Okay? All right. Now the next question is, who are the top non-specialized, the, the top high schools that are non-specialized? Okay? Now, we've collected this list based on a, rate, a new rate that was put on the map only a few years ago called the College Readiness Rate. And what they did was, you know, we have kind of all these numbers that are floating around, but, you know, some schools would kind of overinflate what they were doing with their students. And so with the College Readiness Rate, we're able to see how prepared students are to not just get into college, but be successful while they're there. And so things like, you know, when you get into college and you're kind of freaking out, you're trying to figure out, how am I going to manage all of these different responsibilities? No one's chasing behind my back. Certain students actually thrive better in that because they went to a strong high school that prioritized college readiness. And I know from coming from a school like Bronx Science, I had taken six AP courses, I had taken two college courses, I was in a position where I already knew what it meant to, to manage a heavy workload, so going to, to do, it was a very easy transition. But there's a lot of students who, you know, will drop out after that first fresh, after freshman year or sophomore year because they weren't challenged enough in high school, okay? So these schools are doing the best job in New York City of getting students ready for college. So right at the top is Townsend Harris High School, and that school is in Queens, okay? Then behind that you have Eleanor Roosevelt, you have the Baccalaureate School for Global Education. You have Bard High School Early College. They have two campuses, one in Queens and one in Manhattan. You have Scholars Academy, and we're going to be talking about their middle school because they have an excellent middle school that a lot of people don't know about. 
We have uh, Nest Plus M. Again, that's another school that has a middle school that a lot of people don't know about. Uh, Millennium, the New York City Museum School, okay? We also have Beacon High School. We have Columbia Secondary, okay? Uh, Manhattan Village Academy, we have quite a few students at that school, School of the Future. Manhattan Hunter Science High School, that is an excellent school. Like I will talk a little bit more about it a little bit later. Those students actually get into those that school around, they take the test in sixth grade and they get in for seventh grade and they're pretty much set for their whole pipeline because they can go into college, they get a lot of scholarships. They're like, there's a Macaulay Honors Program that gives you a full ride straight through college. I mean, and a lot of my friends who went into the Macaulay Honors Program ended up on Wall Street just like I did. So if you're talk, talking about getting high quality education for free, these are some of the pipelines that exist for your children, but you gotta know about them early enough because by the time folks start to really learn about it, because the high school admissions process tends to be around eighth grade, you would have missed the Hunter Science um, admissions process, okay? So that's important that you, you know that one. Uh, you have Leon M. Goldstein, that's another Brooklyn school. Uh, Queens Gateway for Health Sciences Secondary, New York City Lab School for Collaborative Studies, um, the High School for Dual Language and Asian Studies, so that's specific, specifically for um, Chinese students who you know, speak mostly Chinese, but they're trying to learn a lot more English. And then Manhattan Center for Science and Math, okay? So just note these schools and start to be familiar with it. I do have you know, the full list right in your packet. So the whole point is these, need, these schools need to be in circulation in our communities. We need to understand that this is the target because everyone else in New York City is clear on that, right? Mm -hmm. But a lot of times in our communities, we're not really understanding what excellence looks like and we don't know what schools are right at the top. Mm -hmm. So we've already put together the list so we kind of like have all of our parents focusing on one list. And so of course that increases the competition which means we have to you know, increase that seventh grade performance. But at least we're all playing the game and we, we're, we're giving access to the right information, okay? Okay. Now here's some honorable mentions. Like I'm sure you're wondering, how come Midwood is not on that list, right? Or Francis Lewis High School in Queens, or Benjamin Cardozo. There's a reason why we opted to not put it on that list. What you notice about these schools is they have multiple programs within the school, and only a few of them do an excellent job in terms of college readiness. So when you look at Midwood, there's a Medical Science and Humanities program, okay? Those are the two programs. You have to get a 90 and above in seventh grade. But then you'll notice there's a general you know, liberal arts program where it's a, a lot easier to get in and, and that program is again, not as competitive. All right, so same thing with Francis Lewis. There's a math research and robotics program and the university scholars program and the science research institute. Those programs have above average college enrollment rates and college readiness rates. And same thing for Benjamin Cardozo, okay? So are there any schools that you expected to be on the list that you, know, you did not see here and, and is there are you shocked about not seeing those schools? Brooklyn College. Brooklyn College Academy. Baker Edwards. Good, excellent. So those are what we call, we call those second tier schools only because the college um, readiness rate is not above 80%. Um, these are still excellent schools, and so we do send our students there if they kind of messed up in seventh grade and they had a lot of like 85s or high 80s. Um, we will still opt for schools like that. But we simply look from the top down and we found the schools that had a college um, readiness rate of 80% or above, okay? So those are still gonna be, out of the 400 high schools in New York City, those are still gonna be better options, but it's not the best, okay? Any other questions? 400 high schools? There's 400 high schools in New York City. Yeah, <laughs> plus or minus five. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so why are the top high schools so amazing? There are only 30 out of 400 high schools in New York City that do an excellent job of preparing students for college, and that's what we've talked about already. And all of these schools are included on this list, and that's, that's pretty impressive. These schools have a long history of consistent top performance of producing exceptional college-ready students. Now here's the thing, like there's a lot of these charter schools popping up on the map. I'm not saying that they might not be good schools, but I just don't think that our children are experiments. And so if a school has not demonstrated lo like a long history of success, then I do not advocate for our students going there. Um, once they kind of have a decade of performance and we can actually see what they're doing, then I would advocate for those schools. But a lot of times, some of the newer schools, they're still figuring things out. And I remember working at um, one of the, like the Kip High School, you know, those students, again, had never graduated in actual class. They were not even performing it above the national average for the SAT scores. Um, and they weren't, you say KIPP or the, KIPP, KIPP, the KIPP High School. Oh, KIPP, okay. okay. Knowledge, is, um, knowledge is Power program. 
Um, great school, you know, they, a lot of funding, a lot of hoopla around the school, but I was there and I actually saw the caliber of the students and they, they just couldn't compete. Mm -hmm. So it's important that parents, you know, if you do want to try to leave school, you got to be extremely hands-on, you know, to understand the quality of education that the child is getting. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if you know that you're a single mom and you just don't have the time for that, I know I came from a single parent household, there wasn't really the luxury of my mom being able to, to go to school all the time we need to make sure that we're opting into schools that have, you know, a demonstrated history of success, okay? All right, so the specialized high schools, um, they only require one exam, all right, for admission, nothing else. They don't care about seventh grade performance, they don't care about state exams, they don't care about anything else but this one test that the child will take in October of the eighth grade year. And then for the non-specialized high schools, that's based on seventh grade performance. So, you know, we always tell parents, you know, students have to do well all the time, but out of all the years, we want to make sure that seventh grade is on point. And we're not talking about 85s, because everybody and their mom has an 85, right? So we have to be getting 90s and above. This is on their, the state test? So state just, test, uh -huh. so that's getting like fours, mm -hmm. you know, like, it's, it's no secret that Chinese communities keep their students about one grade level ahead from third grade. And so like they consistently get fours. And that's why they're able to get into the top high schools. And then for the report cards, you need um, your final report card grade, which is the average of the whole year, to be above 90. So we'll get students all the time, oh no, they did well, they had an 88. They did well, they had an 85, but there's 80,000 students vying for like, for specialized high school, there's only 5,000 seats. You know, and, and that's for the test, but if you're talking about screen programs, it's very similar numbers. You can't afford to just, you know, to have the 80s. But I'm really struck by your comment that Chinese communities keep their children one grade ahead of uh -huh. third grade because that's not coming from state funding. No. So what are they doing? <laughs> They're investing in test prep. And this is why, mm. like, when you go to, like, Queens and you go to, like, Lower Brooklyn, they have, like, 200 test prep companies in one community, and they wow. pay the money. And so, like, we have to recognize that public school is wholesale education. I say that all the time. Mm -hmm. And yes, your tax dollars are going there, but we know that there's a segregation based on, you know, in terms of like how funding is being allocated to certain districts. And so with that, these Chinese and, and Indian uh, families are looking at these schools as an opportunity for long-term economic um, success and wealth creation. And so they know that when you send their, when they send their children to these schools, they're gonna finish you know, with you know, almost an associate's degree. They're gonna end up getting into one of the top colleges. They're gonna naturally end up onto Wall Street. They're gonna get into the tech field, right? So they're seeing that, okay, if I put all of my money into this basket, you know, each of my children will now be worth, you know, you know, $150,000 or more. So when you took out the lifetime income earning potential, it's huge. But again, and I, what I said at a panel like two weeks ago, I was like, I don't think that we're, we're looking that far. I think we're looking at, you know, get our children a good education. They're looking at the economic outcomes around sending their children into these environments. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they recognize, let's pull all the resources behind this at that young age, okay? Mm -hmm. So I think that's the difference in, in, in thought process and the whole you know, education. I think we really trust public schools as a community and we really think you know, the teacher has to do it or the schools are supposed to do it. And I think you know, the, the Jewish communities, and I remember you had said that on a panel, and Chinese communities recognize, no, 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 we're gonna have to take this into our own hands and we're gonna have to make the investment. Okay, because they're not in a better economic position than we are. You know, in a lot of cases, they're, they're struggling more than we are. But they're using the, the little nail salon money and the Chinese food store money and all that stuff to invest in the education. Okay, does that answer the question? It does. Um, so now I'm just thinking, how are they, what economic models are they using to pull it? So this is not just, I'm thinking of research questions for our interns going forward because creating these types of models that our parents can do it. A lot of times we're just, is there a program for after school? Can they dance? Can they do basketball? Can they come home and not get in a fight? So our standard is so low, we're right. not. <laughs> right. But if we had some of this economic structure sort of right. provided, then we might be able to funnel parents in a different way. So this, right. wow. I mean, wow. talk to any Chinese student. They go to school like seven days a week. Right. Now, is that healthy? I think as a community, you know, we're very, you know, we would break with, with personality and we have a lot of like talents. And I don't want to lose that because I think that's a strength. Um, but there is something to putting in more effort. You know, we know that the public schools, again, are not doing, you know, not all of them are doing the best job. Not all middle schools are created equal. So with that, extra effort has to be put in to kind of close that gap in your free time.
you know I would love to say you know let's fix the schools but I, I just don't know how long that's gonna take so I we've chosen the private route um, in terms of starting a company where we can get the job done faster okay um, but yeah like those after schools they're not doing much it's like babysitting you know it's just like oh let me just drop the kid off because I don't I just can't watch them for the next two hours but it's not really packed with quality okay all right and of course the last benefit is students matriculate into the nation's top colleges so um, what else? So there's extensive AP course offerings. We recognize that when you get a four or five on APs, um, you end up op you're not having to take the course when you're in college. So that's saving money, right? Like, like some of these students are graduating from Stuyvesant and Bronx Science with enough you know, course credits that they don't have to be there for four years. So sometimes they're getting it done in three, sometimes they're getting it done in two, and that's saving the parents money. And again, this is talking about economics as a family. This is not talking about economics for the individual. Um, there's opportunities to take a pleasure of college, college classes, access to an elite network of graduates. I talk about Bronx Science, Stuyvesant, and Brooklyn Tech all the time. The folks who graduated from there, they're like, they have their Nobel Laureate winners, <laughs> you know, like they built companies, they're on Wall Street, you know, so you have a network. And a lot of schools don't necessarily have that, that, that to offer you, but specialized high schools do give you that opportunity. Um, they're resource rich, so you want a school that has access to a lot of resources. So thinking about Brooklyn College Academy again, Excellent school, but they, again, not they don't have as much funding. They don't like they don't have a gym. They don't have like an auditorium, things like that. Um, so the students are still missing out on the opportunity to build a strong portfolio. Uh, and we know that to get into college, it's not just about grades. It's about being a well-rounded student. So those are things that we also took into consideration as we comprise this list. Um, there's some brand recognition. So again, as I talk about, just put yourself in the college admission seat. If I'm coming, if I want to fill up my class. And I, I have, I'm charged with the task of going all across America. Every city that I go to, I'm asking where are the top high schools. So automatically, when you come to New York, you're going to Stuyvesant first. You, then you're going to go to Bronx Science. Then you're going to go to Tech, right? So it's kind of like that top-down approach. If I'm an Ivy League institution, I want to scout from the best schools that are already there. So there's a brand that your child will have access to by going to these schools. Make sense? Um, and I talk about that all the time because when I got into Duke, again, I had a 95 average, but my, um, my AP U.S. history teacher, Ms. Fisher, very well connected with all the admissions counselors. And I remember Christoph Gumitag, he came to, um, to Bronx Science, and she just pulled me and my best friend aside and was like, where do you want to go to school? And we were like, we want to go to Duke. And so like, she pulled, she's like, look, these girls want to go to Duke, make it happen. And next thing you know, we get in, you know? So it's like... Again, when we talk about networking, like people think that that only happens in private schools, but it definitely can happen in public schools too. So you want access to that, okay? Um, you have a question? No. Okay. Finally, um, your child will be surrounded by gifted students, and this uh, in itself will motivate them to be exceptional. So high standards are, of course, the expectations. You don't have to worry about, you know, and again, there's are always like some bad apples, you know, anywhere you go, but for the most part. Folks are just nerds, and it's cool to be a nerd. <laughs> so you want that. Um, so some stats about the SHSAT. There are 28, so out of that 80,000 eighth graders that matriculate into high school, there's 28,000, that's about a third, that take the exam, and there's only 5,000 seats available. So you can tell this is extremely competitive. Um, the test is held on the last weekend in October. It's extremely challenging, and when I say challenging, it's pretty much written at a ninth grade level. So if you have a child that's finished seventh grade, they go on break, they're having fun, and a lot of folks love to go on vacation, not saying anything's wrong with vacation, but that summer before eighth grade is not the summer to be, you know, in Barbados and in Jamaica. Because <laughs> we not parents, we sitting down with them, like we have a program to get them ready. But you're going to tell me I can't go to that wedding? You're going to tell me I can't go to this? And I'm like, out of all the, you go, leave the child, let them get the prep. And that's, that's what I'm talking about, value systems and priorities you know, we don't want to make that sacrifice. Um, so that's that's kind of a difference. Uh, and then there's, there's two sections, it was called verbal before, but they switch it to ELA, and then the math section, and then of course you can get the handbook every June of the child's seventh grade year. And just keep in mind, this information is available for all parents. It's not like only seventh graders, parents of seventh graders can get it. So this is your high school directory for 2017. It's already ready. So you can either go to the DOE or go to any of these events, like the event that I was at yesterday, they had a whole bunch of their, them there for free. So you can get it and start to peruse the directory to get familiar with these schools. And every last public school is in the book. And then you have um, the Specialized High School. This is the one from last year, uh, but they're gonna have the new one coming this June. What's really special about this exam for this year is in the, for the first time in 20 years, the SHSAT is changing. 
And the reason why it's changing is because of what you mentioned <laughs> around it not being equitable to certain com certain communities or students from different districts because the content taught on the exam is not what's on the exam. What's well, sorry, the content to, um, expected on the exam is not what's what's taught in schools. So for there were two sections called scramble paragraphs and logical reasoning that students, if they did not participate in the test prep program, would have never even seen. And so you know that was just not fair. So students who had the, you know, the resources or at least prioritized their resources to allocate it to that were in a better position than others. So they figured, let's do away with those two sections and let's align it to what students are seeing in school. And so they have more grammar-related content, um, like editing and rev revisions and stuff like that for those first two sections, and then they still, they still keep the reading comprehension. The exam is a bit longer. Like we're doing a webinar on Thursday where we'll go into more detail about um, what the specific changes are. And then we're also offering a free diagnostic test where you can get a realistic experience with your child sitting down for the actual new exam. We don't, no one really knows what it's really gonna look like until June, but we have adjusted for um, those elements that they talked about, okay? Um, any questions on that so far? Yes. I just want to say those reforms, the case that we were a part of was filed, I think, in 2012. Mm -hmm. We're just now seeing reforms, and the decision hasn't even been made yet. So the students who are entering high school at the time that we filed the case right. already are now entering college. Right. So when you talk about we can fix the schools, but ain't nobody got time for that. Right. We can fix the schools, but ain't nobody got time nobody for that. Nobody got so time for that. I, <laughs> this would this would take probably 20 to 30 years. Right. Being super honest, if we take the school route, and so like we gotta engage the community. Yeah. And like I mean, my team and I, we just really, we realized that. And so we're like, we're going to the schools, we're having guidance counselors work with us to get the parents to be engaged outside the schools because there's a lot of politics and a lot of bureaucracy that prevents us from really closing this gap and closing it faster. Okay, all right. So what were the qualifying scores? It's not like you take this test and you have to get like a score out of 100. It's a score out of 800. You only take one exam and based on how high you score, that determines which school you can get into. So Stuyvesant is only the best school, and I'll get unbiased because I went to Bronx Science, but Stuyvesant is only the best school because they get to take the students who score the best. They have the highest cutoff score, therefore they get the best and brightest students in the entire city. And that, of course, dictates you know, the strength of the school. Behind Stuyvesant, you have, and this will adjust every year, um, the, high school, the, um, the high school that's at, of American Studies at Lehman, then you had Staten Island Tech for this year, that's what was right behind it, then Bronx Science at 509, um, and then you have Queen Science. So this just shows you the lowest minimum cutoff score and then the highest accepted cutoff score, okay, for these schools. The easiest to get into, if you wanna get into at least one of them, is Brooklyn Latin. And again, that school has like about 100% graduation rate, 100% college enrollment rate. It's an excellent school. That one's also an, an IB program, an international baccalaureate program, so more on the British system. So it is very different. School students wear uniform. It's, it's real cute. <laughs> so it's, and it's a smaller environment, like versus Brooklyn Tech. Brooklyn Tech has about 5,600 students, whereas you know Brooklyn Latin is like 400. So there's definitely different schools and different cultures that you know if you feel like your child couldn't really survive in a larger environment, there are other options for you as well. Okay. Okay. Well, we don't have any seventh graders, so I'm just gonna skip over that one. All right, so the screen, okay, before we do that, I wanna go ahead and, and show you guys the video so you can see just uh, the kind of like the difference between the Chinese communities and like the black communities, but still us sharing a similar experience what with being immigrants. Because um, my mom is definitely from Guyana, so you know, a lot of, you'll see a lot of immigrant families at these schools, and so as much as there are differences, I feel like that was our shared experience. Okay, I can just add it. Uh, what is the, 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 the economic, uh, the cultural breakdown of students in New York City? It's about 65% black and Latino, but these schools only have about four to four, or, or I guess that would be around 10% black and Latino. That's a problem. So one of the original reasons why we formed was, you know, we wanted to reflect that diversity. And so we have like reached all kinds of parents but the reality is only certain parents found it to be exciting. Um, and so, you know, that's what we're talking about, that immigrant, you know, that immigrant family kind of saw the, the value around it and they bought into it and of course they did the work. 
Um, but we want this to be available to all families, but of course it takes an investment, at least at this point in time. Now you do have programs like DREAM. DREAM is a DOE-sponsored, um, you know, specialized high school program that is free of charge, that is specifically for Title I, meaning students who are low income. Um, but you know, we've worked with schools, and for whatever reason, those students, are, like our students from black and Latino backgrounds are still not successful with the DREAM program. Um, and so there's something missing. There's something missing. Um, and I know that DREAM is doing a lot of work to improve their program. Everyone in New York City is working <laughs> to support black and Latino students. I think the information just has to trickle into the parents. And of course, we need the actual programs in place to support um, the students, okay? Uh, did anyone have any questions about the video? So that was a lot of information. Hey, this, the cultural distinction between the black American descending community as opposed to the Pan-African diasporic community, uh, I think is in keeping with historical trends in that when you're still living with your Hitler as opposed to leaving home and going to someplace else, there's a different reliance on the system, um, a different belief that we're all, especially if you have an integration mentality, there's a belief right. that we're all working towards progress. And I think that I really appreciated seeing the independence of some of the immigrant community. Right. Um, because that really does speak to sort of the shifting mindset that we have to develop within the African American right. community. Right. Yep. That's like spot on. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, to, it's to get our folks to, to see that, mm -hmm. you know, and parents to see that. All right. So we looked at specialized high schools. Now we're switching gears to screened um, schools. So they're the other schools that comprise that list are just general top high schools. And that, you know, your students will get into schools based on a screen program process. Um, so, as we talked about, there's 80,000 students who are matriculating into high school, and top high schools would admit students based on seventh grade performance, so we talked about that already. The only other thing I didn't mention was attendance and punctuality. We've had students who, again, had great grades, but of course they did not come to school on time, or they miss school a lot. And it's, it's, a, it's been an indicator that students who are consistently late or absent tend to drop out of high school. And high schools don't wanna risk that. So if those numbers are exorbitantly high, students will just not be admitted. So you have to be mindful of that. And if you are working with a company, if you do work with us, please share that information with us so that we can best position your child um, to get into a, a top high school. Um, the, second, the, uh, the next piece is some schools have location restrictions. So like a Townsend Harris, you know, you would think that anyone in New York City can get in, but they do zone to an extent. They're looking for students who are in that region. So a school like that would not be accessible unless you live there. So you'll notice some parents will, you know, take you know, very drastic measures of moving to certain districts so that they can have access to certain schools. Like I know um, District 2 has a lot of amazing schools as well. So do that research. Like Baruch Early College um, is only open to students within that district. So it's just a reality, but there are a lot of other schools that you know, are open to all of New York City. So before you choose that school, make sure you understand their admissions priorities. Uh, then you have schools that require interviews. I don't think parents knew that. Some schools will require interviews, portfolios, writing samples, separate applications like Hunter Science. Um, they, there's, it's a robust process, and I think when parents kind of get to that seventh to eighth grade time frame, now they understand, whoa, this is a lot. So we want parents to start thinking about the process earlier so they're not as overwhelmed and they can make informed decisions. Okay, um, and then sometimes they require an essay and stuff like that. Okay, so again, aside from specialized high schools, as I mentioned earlier, Bard, Nest Plus M, and Brooklyn College Academy all require entrance exams. Now, the Bard exam, it's a, bit of a, it's a little bit easier. It's a writing sample and like a basic math assessment. Students who would get prep for a specialized high school, like once they finish with our program, they tend to do really well, so we have a lot of students at Bard. Um, for Nest Plus M, historically, they completely mirrored the SHSAT. So again, after we, like within our program, we have the prep, and then we also um, provide like at least six practice exams, so th by the time the student sees a Nest Plus M exam, they, they excel um, exceptionally well. So again, if you did not know this, <laughs> you would not be able to be successful on an exam like that. And then Brooklyn College Academy, they only recently introduced an entrance exam for students who kind of messed up in seventh grade. They want to give them another opportunity to prove themselves, so they have the entrance exam that they are requiring now. So just keep that in mind. All right, so we talked about the additional items to, to be mindful of. Beacon, excellent, excellent school. They do require a portfolio. So what that looks like is in your, when your child's in seventh grade, make sure you hold on to their work. 
things that they did an exceptional job on or they it really looked amazing or something, hold on to it because sometimes when you give it to the teacher, they might throw it out. Summertime comes, you're in eighth grade, you need to put together a portfolio, you don't have access to that, 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 that content anymore. So these are things that we kind of coach our parents to be mindful of. Interview, we offer interview prep as well because a lot of times in our culture, you know, children should be seen and not heard. And then while that's great, I know I was raised that way, when it comes time to shine, you know, and really advocate for yourself, that's really where our students are weakest. And they will have 99 average all day, but if they can't really, um, you know, really shine in an interview capacity, they, they don't get it. So, and we know that that's true for private school admissions as well. So, you know, keep that in mind as you, as you matriculate through the high school admissions process. Okay? Any other questions on those additional items? Okay, great. All right, so this was a really important slide that I wanted to share with folks. Um, so who are the top middle schools? Because the same way you want to go to a top high school in order to get into a top college, you got to know what middle schools are doing a great job. Now, it's not all about specialized high schools, but there's something that I love about the specialized high school prep process because I just think it really it separates out who is the, and I'm not even saying that intelligence should be measured through exams, right? Like, that's unfair. But there is something to that grit and that you know discipline and being able to excel on something like a specialized high school exam that for me if a middle school is sending 400 kids into a specialized high school they're clearly doing something right so these 45 schools are doing the best job of getting students into specialized high schools and when i talked about specialized high schools being written at a ninth grade level that means these are accelerated programs okay so you'll notice for if you hear we are in Brooklyn, so I'll talk about some of the Brooklyn schools. Um, Crystal McCullough, out of about and I have the, the numbers on the next page, it's about 300 students. They send about 244 into specialized high schools. So clearly their program is doing something that a lot of the other middle schools aren't. Mark Twain is an excellent middle school to look after. Nest, Tag is excellent. I went to PS 235. Um, it is a smaller school. I was a part of the first graduating class called the Lennox Academy. And at that year, we had only 69 students graduating, 23 of us got into specialized high schools. That's huge for a small school. And to this day, they still are on the list of the top schools in Brooklyn who are doing a great job. Medgar Evers is another middle school that is doing an excellent job. So again, when we talk about the high school versus the middle school, I am in love with the Medgar Evers Middle School. Why? Because they keep their students at least two grade levels ahead. I would work with a student and they have them doing the integrated algebra readings by seventh grade. One of my students, she's doing calculus as a ninth grader at Megger, and it's specifically because of the middle school. So we definitely are huge advocates of Megger, and if you you know you go to Megger for the middle school, your the child's in an amazing position to get into a specialized high school. So just keep that in mind. Um, and, and why is that again? Because the, the child is, is a, it's two grade levels ahead. Nest also does that as well. They do the integrated algebra readings by seventh grade. I was, I was fortunate enough, the tutor that I worked with, he got me the integrated algebra readings by seventh grade. And the reason why I keep focusing on math is when I work with, you know, black and brown kids, the English tends to be okay. Like, after working with them for a few months, they end up getting 40 out of 50 on that section of the exam. But math is, is I mean, it's abysmal. I mean, they're getting 10 out of 50, 20 out of 50. And to compete, it doesn't work if you have... Chinese and Indian students who, from third grade, were maximizing their math scores and getting fours consistently. So it's important that we pay close attention to the math scores and we kind of like work on fixing that a lot earlier if we want this to be a reality for the children. Okay. Um, so there's, there's other schools on here: um, the Anderson School, New York City Lab Middle School. I can definitely share this. There's a website where they actually broke down all of the schools and which schools do a better job of sending black, or well, all the, they, they, this is a, basically a, um, a cultural background breakdown. And you can see Asian students, white, Hispanic, black, and other students right here. If you, I mean, it's kind of hard to see here, but Hispanic is the deep red. Those are the schools that are sending the most Hispanic students into specialized high schools, and then black students, that's like a, it's a deep orange, but it's a little hard to see here. But you can see which schools are doing a much better job. Okay. So this is something that we have to focus on. My daughter's in the fourth grade. Yeah. So and it'll be coming up soon. So um so I'm definitely gonna take a look at this and, and see what Yeah, for you, like their primary goal right now is to get into the right middle school. Mm -hmm. Period. So like my parents for Brooklyn, they're gunning for Lance Academy and Megger. Mm -hmm. Like if you can get Mark Twain, Cunningham, any of those, like there's like five good ones. 
Well, afterward, I have a, I have a, some questions for you. Okay. Just, <laughs> no, I'm not, you know, I don't want to take over. No, you know, no, no, I got you. <laughs> but it's, it's like, some people are like just keep breezing through. And there's other parents who are like from age three, like, right. <laughs> you know, making sure that they get their child positioned. And I just don't know that we all are at the same level of urgency <laughs> around the around the issues. So just keep that in mind. If you chose to live in New York, this is how the New York City education game is played. So let me, uh, just real quick, because since going from elementary to middle school, how did g and play into that? Like, So we're going to talk about okay. that. I'm only going into it briefly, because I don't know where, where we are on time. But basically, I've highlighted for you here, and I have more information on gifted and talented programs. There's five elite citywide gifted and talented programs that any student can get into. And you guys should know that you test into these schools from pre-K, and then you can test in again at kindergarten, first grade, second grade, right? And then at that point, you really can't opt into it, right? You have to, like for these elite five, and you'll notice that, so three of them, the Anderson School, Nest, and Tag, were all feeders to the specialized high school. So this is why I'm talking about the pipeline matters. The only reason why the 30th Avenue School and the Brooklyn School of Inquiry was not on that list is because they've, they will graduate their first eighth grade class this year. Mm -hmm. But these are, they're still excellent schools, so I encourage you to visit these schools. So you can see, again, what is the le different levels of quality that different students are getting, okay? Now, you have, your child at, at pre-K, so that is what, age four, has to score at the 97th percentile to get one of these 300 seats. There's only 300 seats at these five schools. And basically, once they're in, they're pretty much set from K through eight. And it's like kind of going back, I have a friend who got into um, got into Brown and then was a Rhodes Scholar and it's like phenomenal, phenomenal guy. Um, he went to TAG. And again, low income background, but went to TAG. And I'm like, in hindsight, as I'm like kind of doing this work now, I'm recognizing that's how he got into science because he was already on that pipeline getting an elite education at the K through eight level. So it's important that we're prioritizing K through eight if we really want to fix this issue, that we're getting the students you know, to have an, an, an elite level experience from K through eight. Now the reality is there's just not enough seats at the citywide schools. So you have something called district schools as well that you can opt into and that's where, and when I say opt in, I really mean test into because you have to take a very you know, challenging exam and I'm only saying challenging because again, this, these things are not covered in school. So the student would have to get some sort of additional support in order to excel. And so they do have a few more years to get into one of those programs. District schools are not at the same level of citywide programs. That's one. The second thing is I would encourage you to research which district-wide gifted and talented program you have your child in because there is no formal curriculum for gifted and talented programs. So you have some schools that all they've really done is taken the gifted and talented kids and put them in a separate room. They're still getting the same content, but they get to be around the smart kids. So maybe they'll move through the content faster. But gifted and talented should be designed for students to be working on accelerated content. So some schools, again, do a better job than others, which is why, you know, like we, we can't ever be sure. So just keep that in mind as you choose um, gifted and talented programs. But the reality is there's still not enough seats for everyone. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's kind of like a catch-22. They have it there, but how many people is it really serving? You know, so that's, that's kind of unfair. Any other question on giving time, we can talk more about it, like what the process is and everything, but I mean, that's if you have a three-year-old, like you should be starting, if you have, if you know people with three-year-olds, they should be preparing for the gifted and talented program like right now. Mm -hmm. And I tell any of my young you know, parents with young kids, like it's that serious if you want one of those seats. You know, um, okay. Next, okay, so we do have an early, pro early start program. We do work with fifth, sixth, and seventh graders to get them into, um, to get them ready for state exams. And then this, it's a bit of a hybrid, so we do some like you know math team stuff. We we work on speed and accuracy. We recognize that we have to move move backward, um, but to get our you know community to really see the you know the nest the need for it that early has been you know an undertaking <laughs> to say the least. But we do have parents who understand the need for Common Core State Exam prep, so we usually um, focus on that. And then once we can get the child ready with that with that content, we will still squeeze in SHSAT prep and any other accelerated content we can, okay? Um, so for any of you who meet that standard, I don't think there's anyone in the audience tonight, we are offering like uh, one free class over the course of the next two weekends, but of course you would have had to be in attendance today. So um, I don't think there's anyone in the audience for, for today. What about fourth grade, really bright boys? 
Well, I mean, if, if he could if he could make it with fifth grade level content, then I mean, if you we, I'm happy to have these guys come in and sit in. Okay. Yeah, because I was gonna say, so early starts starts at fifth grade. Or yeah, we okay. and we just kind of rolled it back to fifth because again, we're seeing like okay, if we start a little bit earlier, it could help to get them into the top middle schools. Yeah. So that's kind of like a new direction that we're taking now. But most of our program has been at the middle school level. Okay, I think with the two of them, they both. They equal right. fifth grade. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> when well, you add them up. They can advance in fifth grade. Some people in private black writers. They can. They're bright. Right. They right. They they are. Are. Right. They are. Right. They are. Right. They are. Right. So we will, be, we will have a conversation. Okay. okay. <laughs> but yes. Okay. So yeah. So just make sure you submit an application on our website and then we can definitely take it from there. Okay. I'm going to tweet that out so people know. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so just use the promo code TEST45. And again, it's for folks who are in attendance. So that's incentivized people. You got to show up for these workshops um, when you submit the application. And it's right on our website. So we are doing, so I'm doing a lot more webinars. And webinars are easy for parents because they're right at home. They can sit down right at your couch. <laughs> we can, yeah. We've been having this conversation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. You know, folks may not be able to make it into the schools, so we're right. going to bring it to you.